Welcome to Tales from the Periodic Table. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman, and today we're going to talk about the most common element in the entire universe, hydrogen. Here we see the beautiful periodic table produced by Theodore Gray. As I've mentioned in previous episodes, Teo has written one of my favorite books called The Elements, which I encourage you to pick up. Check out his fantastic website, PeriodicTable.com. Hydrogen is the first element in the periodic table. Its atomic number is 1 because that's how many protons are in its nucleus, and that is what distinguishes it as a unique element. I could show you a sample of hydrogen, but since it's a colorless, odorless gas at room temperature, it might be a bit of a letdown. So, here's something a bit more interesting. I blew some hydrogen suds in soapy water and brought them close to a candle flame. Poof. In 1671, Robert Boyle noticed that when he put iron filings in acid, a gas was generated, though he described his gas as, quote, copious and stinking fumes, unquote, that had a sulfurous smell, he noticed that the gas was highly flammable. He did not recognize this gas as a distinct substance or element. Henry Cavendish was the first to recognize that hydrogen was a unique substance in 1766. He called it inflammable air. Five years later, he noticed that burning his inflammable air resulted in water vapor. Antoine Lavoisier gave it the name hydrogen in 1783 from the Greek hydro, meaning water, and genes, meaning creator. Lavoisier created hydrogen by passing steam through a flame-heated, red-hot tube containing iron filings. That produced hydrogen gas through a few chemical reactions of the hot steam and the iron. The hydrogen was collected in a jar on the right after bubbling through mercury. Remember this reaction. We'll see it later. There are 12 elements that are gases at room temperature. This is assuming that Oganesson, OG, element 118, follows the same rules that the rest of the elements follow. They've only made a few atoms of this new element, so we're not sure if it follows the pattern of the elements above it in the periodic table, all noble gases. By the way, there are 14 elements with single-letter designations. Hydrogen is the first of these. The element hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, making up 75% of everything by mass and 90% of everything if you're counting the number of atoms. Given that the sun is made up of stuff of the universe, it's probably not surprising that hydrogen also makes up 75% of the sun, also the most abundant element there. It's the sixth most abundant element in meteorites at 2.4%. Given that these are solid objects, this shouldn't surprise us. Like meteorites, the crust of the Earth is rocky and contains less hydrogen. It's the 11th most common element, making up 0.15% of the weight of the crust. The oceans, being mostly water, and water being two atoms of hydrogen for every oxygen, you might expect hydrogen to be number one. But since we're doing this by weight, and oxygen is 16 times heavier, hydrogen is the second most abundant by weight. It would be number one if we were counting the number of atoms. And lastly, given that we are made mostly of water, hydrogen is the third most abundant element by weight in our bodies, making up 10% of what you see on the bathroom scale in the morning. This complicated version of the periodic table shows the evolution of the elements through the history of the universe. Here, you see each element square with a tiny chart of its own showing that element's growth over the age of the universe by various processes. Hydrogen is here. I understand this looks complicated, but I want you to notice that hydrogen is one of three elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, that are primordial elements. Those elements have white backgrounds. They were created in the Big Bang. 
Let's look at just hydrogen a little closer. The horizontal axis of this square represents time from the Big Bang to now. The vertical axis shows the proportion of hydrogen created by various processes. The majority of hydrogen present today was created at the time of the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. This is represented by the white area. A small part has been distributed by supernovae, the yellow area, and some is redistributed by dying low mass stars, the magenta area. The latter processes don't get started until a bit later in the history of the universe. That's because they must exhaust their nuclear fuel first. Each element has many different forms. For each specific element, the number of protons in the nucleus is the same. One proton for hydrogen. But there can be different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus. All these different forms are called isotopes. They're chemically identical to each other, but with slightly different weights. The number you see next to the chemical symbol is the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus. There are seven known isotopes of hydrogen. And of these seven, there are two stable non-radioactive isotopes, H1 and H2. These two isotopes make up these percentages of naturally occurring hydrogen in the universe. By the way, the word isotope comes from the Greek isos meaning same or equal and topos meaning place, since all these various forms of hydrogen occupy the same place in the periodic table. Those two stable isotopes of hydrogen, H1 and H2, are called hydrogen and deuterium. That's a bit confusing since all isotopes with one proton are hydrogen. There's a proposed name of protium for H1, but I've never heard anyone actually use that. Just to go a bit further, H3 also has a name and is called tritium since it has three particles in the nucleus, one proton and two neutrons. And just to reinforce the point, normal hydrogen has one proton in its nucleus. That's it, just one proton. Deuterium has one proton and one neutron in its nucleus. And tritium has one proton and two neutrons in its nucleus. All have one proton, defining them as the element hydrogen. By the way, these are the only element isotopes that actually have names. All the other elemental isotopes are referred to by their proton plus neutron numbers like carbon-12 and uranium-238. Deuterium was first discovered by American chemist Harold Urey in 1931. Urey and others produced samples of heavy water called D2O rather than H2O, where the deuterium content had been highly concentrated. The discovery of deuterium won Urey a Nobel Prize in 1934. Without neutrons, you can't make deuterium. The neutron was only discovered the next year, in 1932, by James Chadwick, who also won a Nobel Prize the year after Urey in 1935 for that discovery. About that heavy water. As I mentioned, when hydrogen is combined with oxygen, you get H2O, or water. If you combine deuterium with oxygen, you get heavy water, or D2O. It looks and acts almost identical to normal water, but has slightly different qualities as you can see here. Slightly denser at 1.11 grams per cubic centimeter, since there's an extra neutron in each uh, hydrogen atom. And because of this extra mass, it melts and boils at slightly higher temperature. Of the radioactive isotopes of hydrogen, the longest lived is tritium, or H3, with a half-life of 12.32 years. More on half-life in the next slide. This is a mere blink in time compared to the age of the universe, so tritium doesn't exist in nature and must be manufactured in reactors or atomic bomb blasts or by collision of cosmic rays with atoms in the upper atmosphere. I wanted to mention those other radioactive isotopes of hydrogen, H4 through H7, are only made in the lab 
and have amazingly short half-lives. YS doesn't stand for years. It stands for yocto seconds. So these half-lives are from 86 to 652 yocto seconds. I don't blame you if you've never heard of a yocto second. It's an incredibly short interval of time. A yocto second is a trillionth of a trillionth of a second, 10 to the minus 24th seconds, meaning that these atoms decay in less time than light, moving at 300,000 kilometers per second, takes to travel across even a thousandth of the diameter of the hydrogen atom. I don't even know how one would go about measuring such a short half-life. I suspect these half-lives are calculated. What's a half-life? This graph shows an exponential decreasing curve. As an example, let's say we start with 1,024 atoms of any isotope from the previous slide, even the short half-lived ones. If you wait one half-life, half of your isotope will decay, and you'll have 512 atoms left. If you wait one more half-life, half of that half decays, leaving you with one quarter of the original 1024, or 256 atoms. Another half-life, half again as many, or 128 atoms, and so on. Just keep dividing by two every half-life. After 10 half-lives, you'll have about one one-thousandth of your original amount. By the way, notice that there's one remaining atom after 10 half-lives. If you waited one more half-life, your remaining atom would have a 50-50 chance of decaying in that time. Tritium, or H3, was first detected in 1934 by Ernest Rutherford, Mark Oliphant, and Paul Hartek. They did not, however, isolate tritium. They detected its radiation. It was first isolated at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab, then called the Lawrence Radiation Laboratory, by Louis Alvarez and Robert Cornog five years after its detection in 1939. We'll see Louis Alvarez a bit later in the applications. Tritium, with a half-life of about 12 years, decays by beta particle emission. One of the two neutrons in the nucleus becomes a proton and spits out an electron, conserving charge. This beta particle carries away energy. In addition, there's a mysterious and hard to detect neutrino emitted. What's left behind is a helium-3 nucleus. That all happened a bit quickly. We started with tritium with one proton and two neutrons. One proton means that this is hydrogen. When one of the neutrons turns into a proton, the nucleus now has two protons, and that nucleus is no longer hydrogen, but rather helium, one up in the periodic table. Elements do transform into other elements, but usually through radioactive decay or by fission in a reactor or a nuclear bomb. For a gas, hydrogen is the least dense element at 0 0.0899 grams per liter of gas at zero degrees Celsius. Most of the time, we give densities in grams per cubic centimeter, but for gases, we'll use grams per liter. In its liquid state, at minus 253 degrees Celsius, it's almost 780 times denser at 70 grams per liter. Remember that water is 1,000 grams per liter, or in more common terms, one gram per cubic centimeter. Water is just burned up hydrogen, dihydrogen oxide, H2O, hydrogen ash, as it were. Here's a graph of the elements from highest density to lowest density. When I do this talk with an actual audience, I have a set of blocks so you can feel density for yourself. My set of blocks have a wide range of densities, with the densest at tungsten, to lead, to copper, to iron, to titanium, to aluminum, to magnesium. I also have plastic and wood blocks, but those are not technically elements. Again, hydrogen's density as a gas is 0 0.0899 grams per liter, or on this chart, 0 
zero 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 eight nine nine grams per cubic centimeter, the magenta circle, right at the bottom of the density chart. Hydrogen melts, or conversely freezes, at minus 259.14 degrees Celsius, or minus 434.452 degrees Fahrenheit, also at the bottom of the chart. We don't include helium here, since it never freezes at normal laboratory pressures. You have to apply a pressure of 25 atmospheres to freeze helium at minus 272 degrees Celsius. Hydrogen boils, or liquefies, at minus 252.87 degrees Celsius, or minus 423.166 degrees Fahrenheit, only 6.27 degrees Celsius above its melting point. Only helium boils at a lower temperature at minus 268.93 degrees Celsius. By the way, hydrogen was first liquefied in 1898 by Sir James Dewar. Vacuum flasks, like the one you see here, are now called Dewars, though most people today use the commercial name, thermos. How big is the hydrogen atom? Atoms are so unimaginably small that we have to use a scale model. We'll start with this aerial view of the Chabot Space and Science Center. Let's assume that the single proton in the nucleus of the atom is the size of a ping pong ball. Let's move it inside. So how big is the whole atom with its associated orbiting electron? Would the atom be the size of the planetarium dome? Not really. To see the atom, we'd have to zoom out a bit. The whole atom is this size, about 1.26 kilometers in diameter. The actual diameter is about 53 picometers. A picometer is one trillionth of a meter. Electrons weigh pretty much close to nothing. Most of the mass of the atom is in the proton way down in the nucleus, which means the proton's really dense, since the atom is mostly empty space. How dense is the proton? About 400 quadrillion kilograms per cubic meter. Now, that number is pretty much meaningless on a human scale. Suffice it to say that if the ping pong ball were actually nuclear material, the ping pong ball would weigh about as much as Mount Everest. Here are atom sizes sorted from largest, cesium on the left, to smallest, helium on the right. Hydrogen has the fifth smallest sized atom of the elements. You can identify elements by the unique set of colors their gases emit when excited. Every atom has a unique signature or spectrum. Look at a glowing element's light and you can identify it. This makes spectroscopy one of the most valuable tools in science, being used across almost all disciplines. Where do the colors come from and why are each atom's colors unique? This is a very simplistic model of an atom. The nucleus in the middle contains protons and neutrons, and the electrons surround the nucleus in shells. The energy levels of these shells are determined by the laws of quantum mechanics. Electrons can only be in these specific shells or energy levels. Like walking up a set of stairs, you can only stand on the stairs, not between them. Moving an electron from an inner shell to an outer shell requires you to put in energy. When electrons surrounding atoms are excited, they jump from a lower energy inner orbit to a higher energy outer orbit. The excitation energy can come from an electric current jostling the atoms, or it can come from incoming light energy being absorbed. Let's use electricity to excite this atom. Most of the time, the electrons immediately jump back, giving up the energy they gained as light. This is what you see in a neon sign or a fluorescent lamp. The bigger the difference in energy levels, the more energetic or bluer the light will be. Again, this is a highly simplified atom with only four energy levels. There are many, many more. But here, you can see there are many possible jumps depending on how the atom is excited you may get a high-energy violet jump, 
or a lower energy red jump or anywhere in between. Atoms can each give off a whole variety of colors depending on the quantum mechanical arrangement of the energy jumps. A glowing tube of hydrogen gives off a crimson color light. When this light is broken into colors with a prism or a diffraction grating, you see three colors, red, cyan, and violet, given the names H-alpha, H-beta, and H-gamma, a simple spectrum for a simple gas. Here we see the spectrum of the sun. It should be in one long strip, but my screen isn't big enough, so the spectrum is broken into pieces and stacked up in this picture. The dark lines you see are caused by various elements in the sun's cooler outer atmosphere absorbing very specific colors, the same colors they would give off if hot and glowing. So by looking at these lines, we can tell what the sun is made of. Let me label a few of them. You can see lots of elements here, including the hydrogen alpha, the hydrogen beta, and the hydrogen gamma lines we just saw in the previous slide. By the way, it was thought for a long time that the sun was made of the same stuff as the earth. This was proved wrong in 1925 by a brilliant astronomer named Cecilia Payne Gaposchkin. From spectra such as this one, she concluded that the sun was composed mainly of hydrogen and helium. But of course, because of her gender, her assertions were ignored and rejected, only to be verified years later. In her later work, she and her assistants observed over three million variable stars, laying the foundation for many future discoveries. She was the first woman to be promoted to full professor at Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. If you look at the sun in the colors of light given off by specific atoms, you can learn lots about it. Here we see the sun in visible light and in the red light given off by hydrogen, hydrogen alpha. Note the prominences on the edge of the sun normally only visible during a total solar eclipse. Here's the sun in the violet light given off by calcium. Each tells us something unique about the sun. Here's a photo I took of the sun during a total solar eclipse. Notice that the color of the hydrogen prominences on the edge of the sun are the same as the color of glowing hydrogen gas. Maybe that shouldn't be so surprising. If you put a diffraction grating or prism over your camera during a total solar eclipse, you'll get the spectrum of the sun's outer atmosphere. By now, you should be able to identify the three colors made by hydrogen, but there are a few more bright colors made by helium and magnesium, among others. Helium was discovered on the sun before it was discovered on the earth, hence its name, helium, named after the sun god, Helios. Let's take a look at a few applications of hydrogen. I'll only touch on a few of the thousands of uses of this element. Most of organic chemistry, centered around carbon, would not exist without hydrogen. The small, light gray balls here are hydrogen atoms. Carbon and hydrogen can form into long chains, or hydrocarbons. Throw in an occasional oxygen, and you can make alcohols, or sugars. You can also make acids, and, with a few nitrogen atoms, create the acids that make up the basis of all life, the amino acids. Lipids are a broad group of naturally occurring molecules, which includes fats, waxes, sterols, fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamins A, D, E, and K, monoglycerides, diglycerides, phospholipids, and others. Can't have any of them without hydrogen. Being the lightest element, it's very buoyant and floats in the air. It's also very combustible, which is useful and hazardous, as we'll see. 
The first hydrogen-filled balloon was invented by Jacques Charles in 1783. German Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin promoted the idea of rigid airships lifted by hydrogen that were later called, wait for it, Zeppelins. The first had its maiden flight in 1900. Regularly scheduled flights started in 1910. While hydrogen gas has the best lifting power due to its low, low density, it does have its drawbacks. On May 6, 1937, a hydrogen zeppelin, the Hindenburg, caught fire as it was attempting to attach to a mooring mast in New Jersey. It's starting to rain again. The rain had uh, cracked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... It's first time to flash. Get it started. Get it started. It's flashing. And it's flashing. It's flashing. Terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning, bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks between us, this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, 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 it's flashing. Plenty. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is rising to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just screaming around it. It seems miraculous that of the 97 people on board, 62 people survived this horrendous event. Those who were killed mostly died from the fall, not the flames. I suspect that may be because of the fact that hydrogen is so buoyant and most of the heat and flames went upward. However, let's not give up on hydrogen quite yet. While we may want to avoid using it for flotation, it makes a wonderful fuel to get us not only airborne, but actually into space. The space shuttle used hydrogen and oxygen to power its onboard engines mounted at the rear of the shuttle. The solid rocket boosters are only used to help lift the shuttle in its initial two minutes of flight. This is a flight of the shuttle Atlantis that I was lucky enough to attend. Water Note the almost arms. invisible hydrogen-oxygen flame at the rear of the shuttle. Eight, seven, six, four, three, two, one, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis, the final visit to the vision of Hubble into the deepest grandeur of our universe. Notice the invisible hydrogen flames, well, almost invisible. Bypass across the board, scooter, no action. On board the shuttle, they also used hydrogen to directly produce electricity in a device called a fuel cell. The fuel cell is supplied with hydrogen gas and an oxidant, often air, which are placed on the two sides of a polymer electrolyte membrane. Protons can flow through the membrane, leaving behind negative electrons on the anode side of the plate, while charging the cathode plate positively. A current of electrons will flow from the anode to the cathode, and if you attach a load, like this light bulb, the current can power it. Only water is produced at the exhaust. Any unused hydrogen is recycled back into the system. Here's the hydrogen fuel cell from the space shuttle. There were three of these on board each shuttle, providing an average of seven kilowatts each. This fuel cell could easily run your house with power to spare. Toyota has used hydrogen fuel cells in a car you can actually buy, the Mirai. The only thing that comes out of this tailpipe is water vapor. This prototype plane from the company Universal Hydrogen is hopefully the first of many hydrogen fuel cell powered aircraft. It can carry up to 40 passengers for regional flights or alternately cargo. Its electric motors make this a much quieter trip than existing fossil fuel powered planes. This is a retrofit for already existing aircraft and is completely compatible with existing airport infrastructure. This marks the beginning of the conversion to a non-polluting aircraft industry. Of course, when you think about it, everything is powered by the sun, and the sun is powered by the conversion of hydrogen into helium. If you look at the energy density of fuels by volume, 
Hydrogen doesn't look all that practical, especially uncompressed hydrogen gas. However, if you look at it as energy density by weight, hydrogen is at the top. Weight is important since you have to carry your fuel. This does not include fusion power, by the way. Hydrogen can be commercially produced in several ways. The most widely used method starts with natural gas, or methane, which is a carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms bound to it, or CH4. The largest source of methane is the petroleum industry. Very hot steam from 1300 to 1800 degrees Celsius and under high pressure reacts with the methane to separate the hydrogen from the carbon. Byproducts are carbon monoxide and a bit of carbon dioxide, which can be caught and sequestered, but rarely is. Another way to make hydrogen is to electrically rip apart water molecules, H2O, with electricity. You can do this one at home with a 9-volt battery. Stick a couple of thumbtacks through the bottom of a plastic cup spaced to make contact with the battery. Mix a bit of baking soda into water, fill and invert a couple of test tubes over the thumbtacks, and connect the battery. You'll see gas bubbles coming from the two tacks. You'll notice that twice as much gas comes from the negative terminal as from the positive terminal. That's the hydrogen. Obviously, the gas at the positive electrode is oxygen. This takes a lot of electricity, but has no byproducts, just hydrogen and oxygen both of which are very useful. You may have heard of hydrogen colors. It takes energy to produce hydrogen. Hydrogen produced with all renewable energy is called green hydrogen. It's not really the color green. All hydrogen is colorless. If it's produced with energy from much dirtier coal, it's known as brown hydrogen. Not much better. If it comes from natural gas or petroleum, it's called gray hydrogen. However, if you can remove and sequester the carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide byproducts, that hydrogen is now called blue hydrogen. One last color, if you produced your hydrogen with nuclear energy, which is non-polluting, it's called pink hydrogen. How that hydrogen production energy is derived is an important consideration to know ultimately how clean the hydrogen fuel really is. There may be one more very exciting source of hydrogen, natural wells. This one's in Nebraska. Only a few decades ago, in Mali, a well was drilled for water. But rather than the liquid, they surprisingly got a flammable gas, hydrogen. The more geologists looked, the more they found. No one had recognized that hydrogen could collect in wells because, well, no one was looking for it. It was assumed that it reacted with rocks or was eaten by microbes, especially where oil and natural gas was normally drilled. This is a future potential source of environmentally clean fuel. We even have to add a couple of colors for it. Hydrogen pumped directly from underground sources is called gold hydrogen and hydrogen created by pumping water deep into hot iron-bearing rock. Remember Lavoisier's method of creating hydrogen? Well, that hydrogen is called orange hydrogen. Check out this article in Science Magazine for more details. This is a literally cool application of hydrogen. The bubble chamber filled with liquid hydrogen at minus 259 degrees Celsius, was invented in 1952 by Donald Glaser. It's used to detect the paths of subatomic particles and tease out the fundamental structure of matter. He won the 1960 Nobel Prize in Physics for this invention. Here's a photo of subatomic particle tracks in a hydrogen bubble chamber. Remember Louis Alvarez? He won his Nobel Prize in 1968 for his use of the hydrogen bubble chamber to explore elementary particle physics. Let's talk a bit more about tritium. There's very little of it in nature because of its short half-life. In the atmosphere, only one hydrogen atom out of every quintillion is a tritium atom. That's pretty rare. It has to be made in nuclear reactors. 
Here, you see the tritium gas enclosed in a glass tube. The radiation given off causes the phosphors inside the tube to glow. The beta particles given off by tritium cannot get through the glass tube, so users of this form of illumination are not exposed to any radioactivity. Here's a whole bunch of those glass vials. These glow in the dark without being exposed to light ahead of time, like typical glow-in-the-dark material. How can they be used? You used to be able to buy keychain fobs with tritium capsules. That way you could find your keys in the dark. I don't think these are available in the United States anymore. Of course, tritium dots are still available as long as you associate them with weapons, so you can still purchase glowing gun sights so you can aim in the dark. Small vials of tritium used to be available on self-illuminated watches, but these two seem to have disappeared. But maybe that's okay since our current watches are self-illuminating anyway. If you want to be sure that your exit sign stays illuminated in the event of a power outage, you can't go wrong with a tritium illuminated version. Of course, you have to replace these every 12 to 20 years since they get dimmer with the decay of the tritium. With hydrogen as our element this month, we can't ignore its use in warfare. Hydrogen makes both fission and fusion bombs possible. Here's a cross-section of a hydrogen bomb. It contains a primary atomic fission bomb to get things started and a secondary source of fusion fuel. The primary fission bomb contains a high explosive designed to focus the explosive force inward. That explosion pushes a heavy uranium-238 tamper inwards through a vacuum, which then compresses a hollow core of uranium-235 or plutonium-239 containing tritium gas. Below this, there is a secondary device suspended in polystyrene foam, consisting of another heavy uranium-238 tamper surrounding lithium-6 deuteride containing hydrogen fuel with a spark plug of plutonium-239. All this is encased in a uranium reflective casing. Here's how it works. Before firing, we have the warhead with the primary fission bomb at the top and the secondary fusion fuel at the bottom, all suspended in polystyrene foam. High explosives fire in the primary, compressing the uranium or plutonium core into supercriticality, beginning a fission reaction. The fission primary emits X-rays, which are scattered and reflected from the uranium casing, irradiating the polystyrene foam. The polystyrene foam becomes a plasma, compressing the secondary fusion fuel. The plutonium spark plug begins to fission. Compressed and heated, the lithium-6 deuteride fuel produces tritium and begins the fusion reaction. The neutron flux produced causes the U-238 tamper to fission. A fireball starts to form. What does this look like in real life? Here's the hydrogen bomb test called Castle Bravo, exploded on March 1, 1954, on Bikini Atoll.
the Castle Bravo explosion yielded three times the explosive power that it was designed to yield. Let's travel to Bikini Atoll and see what it looks like today. Looks like it would be a great place to snorkel. Unfortunately, it's still uninhabitable because of radiation. You can still see the crater left by Castle Bravo. It's over two kilometers in diameter. You may have heard about fusion on a somewhat smaller scale. On December 5th, 2022, a team at Lawrence Livermore National Lab's National Ignition Facility conducted the first controlled fusion experiment in history to reach break-even. This milestone is also known as scientific energy break-even, meaning they produced more energy from fusion than the laser energy used to drive it. What you see here in the photo is the target chamber with all its laser optics and diagnostic equipment. This is just science, not commercial power generation, which is still 20 years in the future, and has been 20 years in the future for the past 60 years. Here, I've marked in red the campus of the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and you'll find the remarkable place called the National Ignition Facility, or NIF, in a very large building right here. This building is three football fields in size and houses the world's most powerful lasers. Here, you're looking at half of the 192 lasers that power NIF. Note the people for scale. Here's a side view. The room with the blue curtains contains smaller lasers that trigger the larger lasers. All 192 lasers are focused on a tiny fuel pellet about the size of a peppercorn with a diamond shell and a hydrogen-filled center. Actually, the fuel is a mixture of deuterium and tritium. The tiny fuel pellet is placed in the center of this tube called a hull rom. The lasers enter both ends, reflect from the sides of the hull rom, create massive amounts of x-rays, which then heat the pellet to over 3 million degrees Celsius while also compressing it to hold the hydrogen there long enough for the fusion reaction to take place. Two megajoules of laser light went in and a little over three megajoules of energy came out. A gain of slightly over 1.5 and a history-making experiment. Just to give you a bit more scale, here's the target chamber as it was installed. And here's a view inside the completed target chamber. NIF produced energy the same way the sun produces energy, by the fusion of hydrogen into helium. A bit off topic, but in researching hydrogen, I came across this interesting murder mystery novel, The Hydrogen Murder, written by Camille Minichino. Dr. Minichino is a PhD physicist, so I can guarantee that folks into science won't be offended by dumb science assertions. It's a fun read that I can recommend, and there are seven other elementary mysteries in her series. We'll end this talk with Mary Soon Lee's elemental haiku about hydrogen. Your single proton. Fundamental. Essential. Water. Life. Star fuel. In the next program in this series, we'll examine the next most abundant element in the universe, helium. I hope you'll join me. I'm your host, Ron Hipschman. Thank you for watching this Tales from the Periodic Table program about the element hydrogen.